Ahoy! This is uh, hello in Czech. Are you enjoying DrupalCon? Yeah. Have you learned anything new? Yep. Have you been making new friends and meeting old friends? Because this is the essence about DrupalCon, right? Uh, we've had two years where we were lucky and we were able to meet virtually. But I can tell you, nothing compares to this. Nothing compares to be here and see the energy on this room. And it feels a little bit intimidating as well. My name is Alex Moreno. I am a developer advocate for this amazing company here called Pantheon. People ask me, what developer, advocate, developer advocates do? Uh, well, amongst many other things, we, we are a bridge between marketing and, and development and software. And we try products as a developers, because we need to be developer, developers to be developer advocates. What a surprise, right? And when Pantheon offered me to join the company and I rehearsed this, uh, researched these, these products, uh, it was a no-brainer. And I won't be able to show you all these products uh, as deep as I would love to, but if I have to give you some highlights, I will, I will show you multi-dev, for example, autopilot or, or app streams. Imagine that you have environments that you can spin up on demand from feature branches. And when you are done, you test them, you get approvals, you can share that with your colleagues, with your PM, QAs, then you take the environment down. Or imagine everything you love about multi-site, remove the things that you hate about multi-site, and add the things that you would love to have on multi-site. This is uh, upstream, it's a um, shared code base with containers per site, and with the capability to have flexibility to customize the sites at, at the site level, right? And imagine that you want to go to production. What do developers, what do we do? We cross our fingers, right? Well, we don't do that in Pantheon. We have this uh, little robot called Autopilot that will do visual regression testing for you. And if something goes wrong, detects that there is a difference that, you know, something funny, it will stop the deployment and it will ask you, are you sure you want to do this? And then you decide. Actually, this blue button that now is red is fine. I want to change this in production. Or maybe you need to go back and fix something. Um, I will go now to introduce your keynote speaker, because this is the reason you are here. Come to the booth or register on Pantheon.io. Try as well our decouple solution, which is coming soon for uh, full access to everyone. So let me talk about very briefly about the person that I am introducing. She attended a tech conference nine years ago. And when people confused her with a white dress, she decided to start, I'm going to try to pronounce this, Whole Kids Marketing Goo, which means marketing, girls in marketing. She has been a trainer for more than 3,000 people and met with over 300 companies a year. She has one podcast, Trend Spotting, where she does predictions about the future. And I couldn't believe this. She considers herself an introvert, but as an English teacher, she learned how to speak in front of people. Please give me a big applause for your keynote speaker, Paulina Lovitsenska. Thank you. It's really lovely to be here. I have one favor to ask you at the beginning of my talk. Could you turn to the person sitting next to you or in front of you or behind you and introduce yourself? Say hi and introduce yourself. 30 seconds. Perfect. I hear you. I see you shaking hands. 
I see you uh, waving at each other. The other day, I read that people only come to conferences to meet other people and not to listen to keynote speakers. So I'm re really happy that we have it over with. Uh, in 2016, fake news was announced to be the word of the year. Donald Trump was elected, and we learned the hard way that not everything we see or hear is true. We have always thought that we are very good at spotting fake news, that only not so smart people believe things like this. And that's exactly our mistake. University of Toronto did a study and they found out that 70% of people are overconfident when it comes to spotting fake news. It's our own cockiness that makes us not so smart. We just tend to trust fake news. And we, no wonder, because fake news are often really comfortable. They are the nice truths that we're telling ourselves. They are the ones that align with our worldview. You know, the guy is not calling you because his mom is in the hospital. He's probably not calling you because he doesn't want to see you again. And those are the fake news that we are telling to ourselves. As Alex said, I meet over 300 companies a year. And I spot those fake news all the time. And I realize they are not only for my personal life, but they are also for business. So in my presentation, I'm going to walk you through the nine topics that I encounter most often. I will teach you how to spot the fake news, and I will also show you how you can battle them. Maybe tomorrow, maybe on Monday, but straight away. So first one, everyone in my company knows what to do. We have a clear vision. Could you raise your hand if you agree with this statement? Great. Congratulations to those who didn't raise their hand. You just passed the test, is the first fake news. Congratulations to those who raised their hand, and it's actually true, because you are among the 14% of product teams that have a clear vision. Everybody else is that lost. Why is that, that we are so lost when it comes to having clear vision and clear strategy? Because so often our vision feels like this Dilbert cartoon. It's a list of tasks covered in astrology terms. And don't take me wrong, I love astrology. I mean, I'm as every other girl. Talk to me, uh, you know, after the speak. But it doesn't, it shouldn't be in business. So, uh, you are asking me, why do we actually need this? You know, maybe it's a good program to do at the team building, but why should we bother with having a vision other than a list of ongoing tasks covered in astrology terms? What if I told you there is a direct correlation between the clarity of your vision and the financial state of your company? You would suddenly start paying attention, right? And it's no wonder that there is a direct correlation between those two. Because if, you, if your team knows where you're heading, if they know the North Star, where you're going, they can be more proactive. They can, you don't need to micromanage them. If they can be more proactive, then they come up with more ideas. Therefore, your company can be more innovative. If they can work on their own ideas, then they are less, uh, more likely to be invested in the company and they're less likely to leave you. So no wonder there is a direct correlation. Do I have any founders or owners of the agency sitting in the room? Okay, cool. I'll talk to you later. Uh, when we talk, think about the vision, and I hear you thinking like, okay, I understand it. There is a direct correlation between the finance and the clarity of the vision. So tell us, how do we do that? Tell us, how do we craft that one sentence that we are going to put on the hiring posters or in front of the, our reception desk? I have really bad news. For me, vision is not one sentence. It's something that's a DNA of your company that is executed on a daily basis. There is a joke that if you are a keynote speaker and you don't include Patagonia as a case study, you will not get invited again. So I'm going to include Patagonia. 
because I think they are a perfect example of having a clear vision that really translates into everything what you're doing. Their founder was a climber, and he saw how the environment is not very well, in a very good state. And so he decided to start a company that would protect the environment. If you buy a t-shirt from them, it's probably from a recycled material, like recycled plastic bottles or something like this. If uh, that t-shirt uh, turns down, you can bring it back to the store and they will repair it for you. So you don't need to buy any other t-shirt. And it's not only about the product where it shows the DNA of the company. If you visit their headquarters, they flush the toilets with rainwater. They have solar panels on the roof. When they go to a team building, they go to a demonstration against climate change. They even started their own investment fund where they invest into projects and companies that are protecting the environment. And last week, the owner announced that he's giving all his money into a trust fund that has one vision. And you know what I'm going to say protecting the environment. It's all everywhere. This is for the founders out there. I hear you thinking, like, yeah, but I'm quite clear with my vision. I, this is the reason why I started a company. It feels like a tattoo. I am clear what we should do. Bad news, your team doesn't. Uh, Yes, you might be very clear on that, but imagine that junior programmer that joined you a week ago. Probably that one sentence that was written during his onboarding session is not enough. If you don't talk to everyday tasks as connected to your vision, they are lost into this onboarding document. They are lost in, the, in translation. This is one of the most recent Google for Startup studies. And it shows that the most effective founders, that the most successful leaders, talk to their people about their mission and vision every day. It shows that you have to really talk to the people in order to inspire them. So what you can do today to avoid this? Uh, there are two things. First, gather your team and have a look at the document about your vision of your company and talk about what does it mean, actually, those words that you put down. Have you put down consumer-centric? Does that mean that you send birthday cards to your clients? Does that mean that you know them in person? Does that mean that you pick up the phone every time they call? Does that mean that you would uh, do an extra length when it comes to completing their project? What does that mean? Talk about it. And next time when you are introducing a new feature or a product or something, talk about how it actually connects to your vision. Explain that to your team, that this is what it means to be consumer-centric, and this is why we are doing it. Second thing, when I ask you, could you uh, show me your product vision? Could I read it? Often the answer is, you know, we don't need it on the paper. It's in our hearts. It's in our minds, you know. Uh, no, it needs to be written on the paper. Because if you have it written on the paper, then you actually are better at formulating the vision yourself. Then you are better at getting feedback from the other stakeholders in the company. And when somebody new joins your company, they can actually read your visions and they can be really at speed with you in no time. Also, those product vision statements can serve as a learning path. So you can come back to them and actually see what happened in a different direction, what went wrong, and you can actually learn from them. So those are the two things. 55% of startups fail because of people problems. In the second place is a business model, which only accounts uh, for 10% of failed startups. 55% is the highest reason why startups and companies in general fail. So paying attention to your people should be as important as paying attention to your product roadmap or to your sales strategy. And still, we tend to believe that company culture is something that happens during pizza parties on Fridays. It's not. It's something that's engineered and crafted. I'll show you why you should pay attention and why building that company culture is a pure business decision. 
A few years ago, I worked in an agency, and we did a huge study uh, where we were trying to find out why some companies innovate and why some, why, why some don't. And we asked small startups, we asked huge corporations. We were really trying to find out what is it that will stop innovation in your company. And we expected everything. We expected bureaucracy, we expected the lack of resources, and then there it was. It was internal communication. That was the number one reason why companies can't innovate. And again, it's no wonder that uh, it's an innovation blocker. Because if people in your company don't talk to each other, they don't give each other feedback. They start creating silos in the companies that probably fight against each other. And the communication flow is not flowing. So what you can do today? In that study, what we found out that the most innovative companies have one-on-ones with their people at least twice a month. At least twice a month. Uh, what does one-on-one -on -one mean? It doesn't mean reporting to your boss. It means a two-way conversation. It was a dialogue, how the person was do go doing, how they are interacting with the other team, how are their relationships within the company, and so on. Second one, feedback. I come from a country where we hate feedback. We fear feedback more than anything else. You know, running out of beer is like first, but feedback is after that. Like, really, feedback. Because like in the 90s, uh, all the managers, kind of the new managers that were coming to the country, they said, I want to give you feedback. And then they shouted at you for 10 minutes. And so you learned the hard way that feedback is something to avoid. And it took me years to learn that feedback is actually something really great. And to unlearn that fear, uh, I realized that I need to teach my team how to give each other feedback daily, and really daily. So we give each other feedback after every meeting. And after every meeting, we would use a simple framework. It consists of two sentences. I like, I wish. I like that you came on time. I wish you would have prepared more. And it's an easy way how to incorporate feedback into everything that is happening. Third one, again, for my founders and owners of the agencies out there. I know when I tell you to over-communicate, you feel like you are going to throw up. Because your calendar is full of meetings, your Slack channel is booming, your inbox is full. It's just like you feel the communication is like there is so much. But imagine that junior marketer he probably doesn't know that much as you do. And so the best companies actually introduce like really physical spaces, physical meetings or tools, how to actually encourage that communication, how to encourage that spread of the news in the company. So they have all hands. They have a special Slack channel dedicated to celebrations. They have a talk show whenever a new person joins the company, so anybody can ask them. So there, is, like, there are things that are stuck in the calendars of those people and not something that we believe is going to happen just by the fact that we share the same office space. And last but not least, hire HR. And I hear you thinking, we are a team of five people. Why do we need HR? Mark Andersen from the investment fund Andersen Horowitz, one of the biggest investment funds in the world, says that the biggest mistake of all startups is hiring HR too late. It's because when you are five people, you can process everything. But suddenly you are 20 people, and it gets harder. And then you are 50 people, and it's just too late to implement all the communication channels and everything. And I think if we stop thinking about HR department as the hiring and firing department, and maybe start thinking about them as the learning and development department and internal communication department, you can build a business case for that one. Talking about HR, uh, I think this is one that is a most common mistake. When we post an ad for a job site, on a job site and we're like, yeah, we are waiting for the people to start sending CVs. If I told you that I sit at home and I'm waiting for my boyfriend to suddenly appear at the door, like hundreds of them, you would probably laugh at me. 
but you don't laugh at each other when, when I, you tell me that, yeah, I posted on Monster, I posted it on LinkedIn, and now I'm waiting for people to come. Hiring doesn't happen organically. The only thing that's organic is the yogurt you had for breakfast today. Like, there's nothing organic about hiring. Especially in today's market, talent shortages are at 15-year high. We are lacking tech workers, and I know I don't need to tell you, and great resignation is really making an impact across all industries, but especially in tech. But we are so focused on hiring that we actually tend to forget people who are working in our company. An average employee leaving your company could cost you 200% of their annual salary. Just finding somebody new, training them, replacing them, getting them on board with you. So we stop thinking about those because we are so obsessed with hiring new people. And again, I talked to a lot of you uh, outside the auditorium and you told me like, I really love the company, I think everybody is really happy in my company. 72% of tech workers are considering changing jobs soon. You are not safe in this environment, especially where this is Amazon and Meta throwing those big salaries at your people. You are not safe. So what can you do? Go to your Spotify. When I... Uh, open my Spotify account, it will probably look very different than your Spotify account. I, apart from the fact that I will have much more Backstreet Boys on my playlist than you do, uh, I will have different musicians, I will have different repeat songs, and so on. And the same applies to your people who work in your company. They all have different Spotify accounts. They all have different motivations for staying or leaving your company. For some of them, it's a salary. For some of them, it's a work-life balance. For some of them, it's a fact that they can take their dog to the office. By the way, 90% people uh, after COVID said if their company didn't allow them to take their dog into the office, they're going to quit. Think about it, you know? Or uh, there can be a motivation of learning on the job and really like having great people around. So there can be so many things that you can uh, think about. I'll guide you through three case studies of companies who have understood that when you're hiring, you are not hiring people, but you're hiring people with special needs with different Spotify accounts. Google was very famous for hiring a really long time. It took them six months before they would give you an offer. And if you are a senior person, you just don't want to wait, even though it's Google. So what they did, they realized that senior people don't want to wait, and they uh, shortened their hiring process in order to last maximum 45 days. This allowed them to be competitive on the market. By the way, the upcoming generation, Gen Z, are not willing to wait more than two weeks to get an offer. Another one, CDN77 is a Czech startup, and they were hiring developers, as everybody does. And they have done research, and they found out that tech people hate meetings. They just hate that. They want to sit at the computer, work, but don't do meetings. So if you go to their hiring website, uh, one of the big biz benefits am I next to the going to the gym or food vouchers will be zero meeting policy. You don't need to go to any meeting if you work for us. And last but not least, I talk to a lot of you, and you're like, oh, there are no people in the market. There is nobody else to hire. But then I look at your job ad, and you're basically looking for a unicorn, like somebody who, know, who knows three programming languages, graduated from Harvard and Stanford, holds an MBA, and speaks English, German, and Arabic, and probably something else. You know, you are missing out, for example, on women. There is a McKinsey study that says that women only apply to jobs if they fulfill 100% of the requirements on the job ad. For men, it's enough 60%. So you're probably getting a lot of CVs from guys. Yes, you are. But there is a reason for that. 
So for example, Yelp was among the companies that audited their hiring process. And they made sure, for example, that women get asked the same questions as men on the interviews, because they usually get asked different questions, like, what are you doing, going to do if your kids are sick? They have a debt. Uh, or they audited the process in order on the hiring committee to be more women, so you don't only face men in the committee, and so on. So you can really move it in order to hire more people of color, more in order to hire more women, and so on. So what can you do today? Ask your employees how, you are, how they are doing, if they are thinking about leaving soon, you know? And don't trust them if they say no. Like, just make them happy, because this is something. Think about how you could create a tailor-made experience, not only in your job postings, but also in your company. Can you introduce the zero-meeting policy? already for the existing employees, do it. I, can you introduce having dogs in the office? Do it and invite me. You know, like, uh, and last but not least, please hire a diverse team. And I'm going to say that again, hiring diverse team is a business decision. According to Harvard Business Review study, diverse teams are 170% more innovative than the teams who are just, you know, Mono. Mono. So, I talked to some of you uh, and asked you, what do you do? And you replied, we build websites. True, technically true. But it's the same way if I asked you, what's Tinder? And you would answer, it's a dating app. That's technically true. But for me, Tinder is a place where I can find the prince on the white horse and spend the rest of my life with and have probably 20 babies and 20 puppies. It's something different. And the same goes for your company. When Slack was launching, they forbid their people to talk about them as a group chat system. They said nobody on the market is shopping for a group chat system. But what they are shopping for is 75% less email. They are shopping for more effective communication. When your clients are shopping for you, they are not buying your dream of building websites. They are buying their own dreams. They are buying that community. They are buying a blog that gives them a shot of being a writer. They are buying a startup that allows them to leave the corporate job they hate. They're not buying websites. So, but it's no wonder that we believe that our clients are buying websites if we don't ever talk to them. Only one in five product teams regularly talk to their customers. So it is quite understandable that only 50% of product team feel that what they are developing actually reflects customer needs. But what if we actually started talking to our customers? What if we actually started understanding them? Then we could understand what are their jobs, pains, and gains, and we could create campaigns, products, and features they will actually want to buy and they will love. If we, if we did that, we could create a sales strategy that actually sells and sticks. And also, if you let your people talk to uh, the actual customer, they will be more productive and happier in the company, as shows this Adam Grant study. This is after five minutes of talking, you have 171% of increase in productivity because you see your work in action. So for me, one of the first things is call your clients, call your customers, uh, go for a coffee with them and ask them how they're doing, what's their dream, how their business is actually expecting this economic crisis coming, how they went through COVID and so on. Second thing, introduce continuous product discovery. It means that you are doing research while programming. You are not doing research only once a year or because Pavlina said it. You are doing research continuously and you are continuously implementing the findings into your product. And last but not least, try to include all the team members 
or at least everybody who's interested, slightly interested at least. Uh, what they can do, they can shadow a UX designer, they can talk to a sales team and discuss the win and loss spreadsheet. Why did they lose the client? Why did they win the client? You can have a briefing with customer care and they can tell you why pe what people are asking about. And it can be like such an empathy. One of the best things I have seen with the teams I was working with was that every Friday, the programming team, instead of listening to Spotify, they listened to customer demos while they were programming. That built so much empathy with the consumer that they were uh, developing for. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, you can use the app, send the questions, and we will talk about them in the Q&A session. So if you're thinking about something, uh, put it in the app, and we will discuss it. OK, the next fake news. Uh, our marketing strategy is to be a love brand. No, no. Uh, the other day, I talked to a company. I asked them, what is your target group? Who is your customer? And they replied, women 20 to 8 years old. I was doing a face palm. Because literally, if you think that your target group is women 20 to 8 years old, you end up doing products and campaigns looking like this. If you think that your target group is women 20 to 8 years old, you will actually think, start thinking about them as if they were a user, a faceless something without any emotion. And if you don't have an emotion, you can't stick your messaging. You can't stick your brand anyway. It will just slide. But what I want you to do is to start thinking about your customers, about your clients, as if they were people. They actually are people, probably. Uh, start, thinking, start thinking about them as people, with their emotion, their stories, and their needs. Once you start doing them, you will suddenly find a perfect niche. You will suddenly find somebody who you don't need to persuade to buy your thing, but who will be so happy to find you, and they will be like, Mm, jumping on you with the money. This is a quote from the Twitch founder, so I kind of guess he's right. He, he got it right. Once you have that niche, uh, one thing, uh, I hear you saying, okay, but what if we are missing the business potential? What if we are missing a lot of clients? All great companies started with a niche. All great companies started small. Stripe, focused on product uh, managers at startups. Lyft, they focused on young tech employees only in San Francisco. Uh, Substack focused on veteran online newsletter writers. How many people are that? Like, tch, nothing. And my company, we started uh, with targeting only young, ambitious female marketers in Prague. That's like 50 people. Now we are 30,000, and we could have grown only because we started small. There is a way how you can identify your perfect niche by seeing only one product or one type of behavior. There is only one product that Tesco needs to see in your basket in order to say that you are a foodie, and that's sun-dried tomatoes. Because if you are not a foodie, you would not pay $15 for ugly tomatoes. If you are a foodie, you know that dry tomatoes are great with a quiche and pasta, and you're so excited to have them. So there's only one moment in your customer journey in order to identify the customer that is perfect for you. Once you have that niche, you need to start pushing. You need to oil your growth engine and start going. What is a growth engine? There are four types of uh, growth engines out there. There are four strategies how you can acquire new clients. First is virality, then SEO, then paid ads, and then you have sales. Virality, we often think as viral, as like a viral TikTok video that went viral. No, virality in my world is growth hacking. It's a conscious decision to build something in your product that spreads the word of mouth. Uh, so, for example, when Dropbox launched, they had this referral program 
that allow them to grow. LinkedIn, they were so good because they actually got into your Outlook contacts and sent them an invite to that social media site. SEO means that people who are looking for your product are actually able to find you. They are, if they're looking for an answer, they are able to find it on your website. When uh, Quora started, they had so many landing pages for questions like, how do I scale my business? Does elephant uh, sleep on the floor? Or something like this. When Yelp was starting, they had so many landing pages for restaurants and exciting businesses in, in your neighborhood that you would actually end up uh, uh, coming to them. Third one, you know, uh, I always say, if you don't know how to solve something, put a lot of money on it. So yes, paid ads. Uh, Booking.com was uh, one of the companies that really allowed to grow with Google Ads. They started in very early when the Google Ads were starting, and this is how they got so big. And last but not least, and I think that is applicable to a lot of you that's in the audience, sales. When PropHub was launching, they went door to door to every restaurant and they said, hi, do you want to work with us? When Udemy was starting, they went one by one to top experts and they said, do you want to launch a course with us? So that, once you, what they have in common, all those companies, is exactly what that Lenny's quote said. They chose a primer, uh, primary growth engine. They chose only one of them. They were not trying to chase all of them in one basket. When I see you uh, and your company, and you have an account on Pinterest, Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, I'm wondering, how do you have time to manage them all? So choose one and be great at it. Choose one that really fits your company. If you are outgoing, choose sales. If you are uh, more uh, technical, choose virality and so on. Once you have that uh, growth engine decision, start pushing. In order to sell a car, you need to have 900 interactions with your client. 900 interactions. In order to sell that simple white t-shirt for $10, you need to have 14 interactions with a consumer. So imagine how much time you need actually to build trust and sell that website. You, there, it's a lot of time. And everybody who works in B2B marketing and B2B sales will tell you that this is a kid's book illustration, that it's actually far more complicated than this. So, you know, thinking that you will do sales just with one Facebook ad or just with w attending one conference is not going to do it. It will take time. So what you can do today? Agree who's your niche. I really love framework that's called Jobs to be Done that allows you to find people who are actually uh, your perfect consumers. Choose a primary growth engine. Choose what you're good at and push on that. And focus. Don't try to do everything. Don't try to jump on every uh, new social media site that you find. In B2B sales, we often confuse people for companies. If somebody turned us down, that means the whole company turned us down. If somebody said no, that means they said no forever. But that's not actually true. So many times, it means that that one person said no. But there are other people who might be shopping in for your product in the same company. Maybe the HR department needs, needs your product, or maybe marketing department needs your product. Also, the fact that they said no now doesn't mean that something will not happen in six months or a year that will change their minds. In my world, there is no B2B or B2C. It's only a human-to-human -human business. And if you start thinking about your clients, your customers as humans and with their needs, you will actually understand that they have different personas, that they have different needs. People who are buying your product, who are going to pay for your product, people who are going to use your product on a daily basis, and people who are going to influence the purchase of the product. And each of them have a very different motivation and a very different KPI. So usually the CTOs want an easy implementation. 
the CMOs want publicity. Uh, the users want them want it too easy to buy. And everybody, what they are looking for is fulfilling a KPI to get their yearly Christmas bonus. So for me, mapping your stakeholders and understanding their needs and KPIs. And I usually, when I'm in a sales meeting and I ask, what are your KPIs? Could you share with me? How can I help you to fulfill them? And it's my question before I start talking. Uh, so mapping your stakeholders and then creating materials for those different needs and different personas with different messaging. So for example, a programmer you are talking to at the company has a PDF that he can forward to the CFO so he actually understands that he can save money with your tool instead of the programmer pitching it, it to him. In only three months, the e-commerce has grown at the same speed in the last 10 years. The world is fast just right now. It's accelerating so fast that we should understand that our strategy is going to change all the time. I mean, this is true maybe only at the wedding altar, but not in business. Like everything is changing constantly. The acceleration is fast and every technology adoption is faster than the one before. It's running so fast, I think that we feel like we don't know what to do with that. It's just like, what's happening? What's happening? You c what if I told you that you can actually predict the future? Transporting agencies like WGSN claim that they have a 95% certainty when it comes to predicting what will happen in 10 years. And they're not talking about COVID, but they, what they predicted is the rise of audio, the fact that you are listening to audiobooks or podcasts, or that you have Alexa or Google Home at home. They have predicted the rise of sustainability and that we will be passionate about the environment. They have predicted people like Kim Kardashian coming into the spotlight. They have predicted that we will want to work remotely even before COVID happened. So what you can do is actually have a look at those transporting reports. I'll be sharing them in my deck. And have a look at them and talk to your team. How could we respond to this sustainability trend? I talked to one of you uh, downstairs uh, at the booth, and they offered me a, a bottle. And they said, oh, it's because we, are, we take care of the environment. We are sustainable. You know, that is exactly kind of jumping on the sustainability trend. So think about how you could jump on those, how you can react, for example, to Gen Z coming into place. Second one, we as trend forecasters, we use scenarios in order to predict future. So we sit down and we say, what if this happened? What if this happened? What if this happened? And it has really helped me with business. I think about what would happen if we grew 200 person next year. What would happen if we lost our biggest client? What would happen if our whole development team left? And I create those scenarios saying, OK, we will do A, B, C, D, E. Probably none of those will happen, but at least I have some pieces to take out when something happened. So I have a prediction. I know, for example, how I should be thinking about the investments of my company or how I should be thinking about hiring. One of the things I'm using uh, is a pre-mortem analysis. Could you raise your hand if somebody is also have used it? Thank you. Amazing, amazing. Um, imagine that you are you, but a year from now. So you're here sitting at the Drupal conference and your business completely failed. Like everything, you know, everything failed. Think about what were the reasons why your business failed? Was it that your client left? Was it that you had a fight with your co-founders? Was it that the economic crisis made you pay for energy bills 10 times more? I don't know, what is it? But think about what could be all those scenarios, probable or not probable, like what could be that? That could happen. And then prepare the strategies, how you could avoid them, how you can prevent them. So maybe have a call with your co-founders and say, hey, what's your vision for the company? Or call your biggest client and say, hey, how are you doing? Everything fine? What do you want to do next year? 
or think about what, what would you do and how you could prevent that. 95% people considered quitting during COVID. It's because we are all tired and burned out. And no wonder, COVID, war in Ukraine, economic crisis, everything happening at once. You know, and it must be so difficult. And imagine how difficult it must be for people who have kids. I can't imagine that. Like, it must be so difficult. So I think we should ditch this idea forever. It should go into the recycling bin. The idea that if we work harder and play harder, we can do it all. Honestly, that's, that, that shouldn't be here anymore. And especially, I'm talking to the founders out there again. You're 50 more percent likely to suffer from a mental health issue than everybody else in this room. You are twice more likely uh, to suffer from depression and anxiety and twice more likely to commit suicide. It's because of all the pressure that is on you. And yet, we as founders and CEOs, we love taking on the new projects. We just like kind of start jumping like puppies after everything that is out there. We do love it. So for me, when I talk about prioritization, I always say it's self-care. I don't do self-care like massages and essential oils and meditations. No, it's prioritization. Because for that is me saving my own mental health. Uh, if you learn how to prioritize, I don't care if you use RICE model or Kano or what type of models you use, but just prioritize. And prioritize for the sake of your team and teach your team to prioritize. Because this exhaustion is really leaning on all of us and we need to fight with that. One of my favorite things, uh, what Google does, is a funeral. Uh, because I know, for me as a founder, I often love those projects and, and I kind of they become my babies and I don't want to let them go. And yes, all the prioritization models say that I should let them go, but I'm like, yeah, but you know, there was so much energy in them. And what they do is on November 2nd, on Dia des Muertos, uh, they organize a funeral for all the projects that they are letting go. And they are like, you know, they are saying like, yeah, we put a lot of energy in there. Yeah, it was great. It was great working on that, but let's bury that. And next time somebody comes to the office and say, shouldn't we take that project again? They're like, they're ghosts, they're dead, you know. And I think it's such a nice ritual. Maybe it will not work in your company. I just, I just love it. I, and I think it's a very symbolic gesture. So first thing I would love you to do once you get outside of this room is ask yourself, how are you? Are you tired? Are you burnout? How are you? Because I think there is this cliche about putting an oxygen mask on your first in the airplane that is actually true. That's why it's a cliche, because it's true. Once you fix yourself, I mean, go to therapy or something, uh, then try fixing your team. Ask them how they're doing. Do a happiness survey. Uh, take them for a beer. Ask them about their personal life. How are they doing coping, having small kids and at the same time working remotely? How has the recent divorce affected them or something? Ask them. With my team, I would have a Monday morning check-in and I would ask, we would do a circle and everybody would say how their weekend was, how are they feeling? And some people would say, yeah, I went to this great party, I got drunk, you know, all funny. And some people would say, I broke up with my boyfriend. And suddenly, you build this empathy within your team. You know that you can't push on the person that just broke up. And I think this is a way how to really bring that uh, sense of empathy into your team. And last but not least, prioritization. I'm not a native speaker of English, and um, there is a word in Czech that's musim. There's a pressure to do something. In English, you actually have two words for the same meaning, and that is have to and must. And if you're learning English, you realize that they have a different meaning, those two words. Have to is doing something from an external pressure. You have to fill your taxes. Must is doing something from an internal pressure. That means I must call my grandma. 
And when I'm prioritizing, I'm thinking about keeping the balance between the have tos and must in my life. So I don't actually lose the things that I must do, I want to do. After all those nine fake news, I have one piece of hard truth for you. Only one in 10 startups survived the first year. I shouldn't be smiling saying that. Uh, they don't survive. You are more likely to fail than not. But for me, it's not about winning. It's not about selling that company and becoming filthy rich and marrying Angelina Jolie. It's about finding the people that you meet on the way. It's about uh, learning new things. It's about growing as a person. And that is exactly why I asked you at the beginning to say hi to the person sitting next to you. Because they can become a friend that supports you on the journey. They can become a mentor uh, for you. Or they can become a co-founder of your next business. Thanks a lot for fighting those fake news with me. And uh, here's the deck. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and your questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, we are going to sit down. Thank you for a very good talk. And she said it earlier, there is an app uh, where you can ask questions, but we also do have microphones. So that's also a very nice thing to do, is to stand up and actually do ask questions live. Um, but I have a, maybe this starting off, um, I have a couple of questions that or I'm thinking about after your talk, and one being um, you talk about no meetings or no meeting policies, but still giving feedback. Um, and we are all working, or many of us are working in remote teams, where sometimes the daily is the only time of the day that I actually meet someone. <laughs> and I'm curious to hear, is this really like that? That you know, or are the, cha or the are the meetings just changing, becoming like something else than just the, you know, are people still meeting online? and talking to each other? What's, what, what have you been seeing in the, in the companies that you've been? I think what we need to realize is that meeting always has two components. And it's updating each other on the project or communicating what's uh, on our product roadmap. But it's that human part of it. And if you jump on the call and you're just without, hey, how are you? And you just go into that and then you say bye, then you can start becoming very lonely. You start becoming disconnected from that. So I think it's great, for example, in one company I worked for, ev at, at the beginning of every meeting, there was something called a check-in, where you would say how you are feeling, everybody on the call. And then there was a check-out saying, how, what's your takeaway from this? What, with what kind of emotion are you leaving that meeting? And that really like took five extra minutes, ten extra minutes, not not more, but really like kind of let us develop the empathy. And I think with remote work, it's really easy to those, uh, do those only transactional meetings, like kind of let's get it over with, like, mm -hmm. let's do the status in Trello. But you know we are forgetting that we are also humans. So making it more personal is better. Yeah. Okay, so, and, and you talked about one more thing. You talked about predicting the future. And now winter is coming. Um, nobody knows what is going to happen in the next few months. But not only that, um, there has been, you talked about talent, hiring, that people have been changing, you know, jobs very frequently. But we are also seeing the other trend now because people are scared this is what's going to happen. Uh, I live in Germany, and, uh, you know, if you read the news there, probably most of them fake news, but... If you read the news, you, you actually do get scared of, like, will we be able to heat our houses? And, and clients talk about that. They are starting to cut budget. Is this, you know, can you, can you predict what's going to happen in the winter? And, um, and how is this going to affect our jobs? Or do you know anything about this? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I think I will talk in general first, and then I'll go back to uh, your part of the question and a detailed one. Uh, one of those transporting WGSN, uh, they released uh, three consumer archetypes and the way how they are going to react to crisis. And I think it's really good to kind of maybe go through them and realize that there are different ways how we cope with what's happening out there. 
First type of people are called new optimists, and they love crisis. I mean, it's an opportunity to grow. If you think about COVID, those were the people who started training for a marathon during COVID. Those were the people who suddenly lost a lot of weight, who started learning how to bake a sourdough bread. Those were people who were excited to kind of get onto new opportunities, use the remote work. Then you have people who are stabilizers, and those are people who just kind of like close themselves, and they started uh, kind of behaving only in their local communities, and they really missed their work because they missed the office, they missed going to the canteen, and they, what they were hoping for was for things to come back to normal. And well, the third ones were the settlers, and I think imagine parents with small kids during COVID. Those are typical settlers. So, like, there's this sense of overwhelming, and there's too much everything, and everybody's pressuring, and you're trying to handle all the plates and all the juggle balls in the air. And what you're looking for is the sense of easiness, the clarity, the simplicity. So, for example, if we were to, uh, talking about how we should communicate with those people in the company, the new optimists, they are looking for new opportunities, new projects to take on, new, new things, because otherwise they will be looking for them outside. The, the settlers, the, uh, the stabilizers, they are more looking for you offering them uh, a reassurance that everything will be fine. And the last one is just going for the, like, do I still have a job? Okay, fine, let's not do more emails. So I think, uh, coming back to your question, it's, um, for us, it's important to communicate with our employees what's going to happen now. Do a scenario with your management team and think about, uh, okay, what are we going to do if the energy is 10 times more expensive? What are we going to do if our sales team can't bring us uh, enough? And communicate that to your team. Assure them that everything is fine, but also think about all those types of people that you will be addressing. Think about the new optimists, if you can offer them a new project, so they will be more likely to stay. Talk to the stabilizers and say, maybe the th uh, state of, uh, for example, work, um, work market is not so shiny and rosy, and you should stay with us because this is the stability you're looking for. And talk, uh, think, talk to other people and say, Hi, can we uh, help you with the economic crisis? And I think they will be more loyal. And in case you would need to, for example, talk to them about firing some people, they will be more understanding and more empathetic to your business decision. Okay, good. Uh, any questions from the audience? Because I have a few here in the app, but I want to see if there's anyone here. You just raise your hand. They are walking around with the microphone if you want to ask something. Um, Franco asked here a question. If the top management does not communicate vision, culture, values, how can them as a team lead build that on the level of, like, for their team? Like, if they're not getting it from the top management, but he still wants to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, how does that work? I think, uh, I don't know if Franco is out there, uh, but dear Franco, uh, I think it's about, you can still do it. You understand some, some of it from the management and you can really translate it to your everyday decisions. And I think each of us as a manager have this philosophy and this character that we are putting into our decisions daily. So I think you can translate it to your team and you say maybe it's kind of, uh, you will decide on your team that what, what you want to build should be consumer centric and you will be really talking about it. But also there needs to be some reflection from your management team and we as one note we as managers we often think that people we should be working for are our teams but who we should be working for are the stakeholders of the company so try to push on them to give you the clarity try to show them the data I showed you today and say I really need that from you because yes I can be playing the game with my team but also uh, if you don't give me this, we are losing as a company. So yes, it's one thing of managing the team and being very empathetic and very human for them and leading by the example, but also make the pressure on the management. They shouldn't be able to get away with this. So if Franco's boss is in the room, <laughs> then uh, <laughs> Franco me. is going to have a serious talk with you later. Okay, so um, Dan actually wanted to bring a co completely different question. And that's, uh, this is 
your first keynote for the Drupal community at DrupalCon. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really good. Everybody has been so nice to me, and I think I love it. And can I come next year, please? Okay, so okay. We're going to be talking about that later. <laughs> So that was obviously that was obviously the plug in that in the wrap up ceremony later we are going to be talking about where we are going in 2023 um, but let's wait with that a bit there are more questions here um, how do you actually keep the drive for the this is from Westerly Andre how do you keep the drive for the team in a long term time perspective because People are just usually getting tired for so many things. That we are just tired now of COVID. We are tired of, of so many things that are happening in the world, uh, in Ukraine, and so on. So how do you actually keep the drive still in this fast-moving world? I traveled here uh, straight from a team building with, uh, with my team. And we, uh, we talked a lot about the future. And I think how you can get energy and motivation from your team is actually get them invested in your thing. And how do you get them invested? Be, by being proactive, by giving them the opportunity to come up with new ideas, uh, to come up with projects that they could be working on. And I think it's no coincidence that Google has this 20% rule, the famous one, that 20% of your time that you get dedicated to your side projects, that you can work on other projects in the company. And I think that's how you keep the excitement, the fact that you talk about it, you have the opportunity to shine, and you also have an opportunity to uh, do something that really excites you. First thing. Second thing, I talk to them a lot about their future. And I'm not afraid to ask my team, what do you want to do when you leave this company? And how long are you going to stay in this company? And I want an honest answer. And if they say, I want to stay here a year because I want to work for an international advertising agency, I will think about how I can make their CV better so they can actually go and work for that agency. I'm thinking about how I can help them achieve that goal. So they give me all that energy for that year that they are staying with me. And I think that's another thing to understand, like, what's their motivation, where you are, what's, what kind of role are you playing in their field? And last but not least, um, some people will be always super active and energetic and happy, and some people will not. And that's a fact. It's like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like Pinterest. A lot of people are adding pictures to the interest. Other people are just blousing the Pinterest. So it's some people will, will be kind of not joining your team building and not being excited on Slack and so on. But that's the fact of it. And that's normal. Some people react differently. So what I really like, and, and I come from a country that we are 350,000 people. And what stuck, what, what was really interesting for me when I moved uh, to Germany is that everybody, like not everyone, but very many people in Iceland, they have actually at some point in their time, you know, they've been excellent at something. And so we have this mentality that, that we are the best. That's just like, that's what we believe. And when we are, you know, we are like, my husband said to me like, buddy, regardless of who I meet, that person has always been like the Icelandic champion in Dart. The Icelandic, you know, was in the national team in that. You know, is anybody in your country that has not actually exceeded in something? And then I thought back and I said, in Germany, it's actually a lot of history that is there in that country. And Germans actually do not really like to talk about them being the best in anything. And that's a historical thing. So for me, coming into a, a great country that has like amazing people, very smart, and they are just always thinking that they are actually not very good. That surprised me a lot. And I do think that, and, and when I think about it from a company perspective, and it, it goes a little bit to what you said, is that how can you find the niche? Because we are all good in something. You know, we just maybe not necessarily know what that is. And I do think that's the responsibility of the management to try to figure that out, but also of you as an employee of a company to actually also try to figure out where you can shine. Because if you shine, you get this positive you know, feeling and that you like actually you have achieved something. And that is something that I've learned from Iceland. And where I try to like say, be the best you you can be, you know, and, and try to figure out that for yourself. And that's also your responsibility, not just the manager's responsibility. 
Can I add one thing? I, I come from a country where uh, you are not supposed to shine. My mom, I told her, I'm giving this talk at the DrupalCon, I'm so excited. And she said, oh, I completely hate it. You know, I don't think you should sh show your face out there. And that's my mother, you know. So uh, we are not very keen on having champions in my country. Uh, but so for me, it's very difficult to fight my own nationality and especially having an imposter syndrome. Uh, but what I, what I developed as a tactics, um, I, I learned it from Beyonce. And Beyonce, when she goes on stage, uh, she has a different persona. It's called Sasha Fierce, mm. and Sasha Fierce is fierce on stage. And so whenever I need to uh, be a champion in something and go somewhere and talk in front of people or say, oh, we are very good at this, or I'm very good at this, I pretend I'm Zlatan Ibrahimovic. <laughs> Okay. And I truly hate it. I, I truly love that guy. And like, you know, and it helped me. And b before going on stage, I would be like, oh, I'm so stressed and it's horrible. And then I'm Zlatan and I can do it, You're you know. <laughs> so, so maybe you don't have this Icelandic uh, upbringing, but create your own Zlatan and just go out there and be Zlatan. And that little bit, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so that. So that brings me a little bit to the, the questions around diversity. And you talk about feedback in your talk. You know, give others feedback. Now, we are here from very different cultures, and I just told you about two cultures being the Scandinavian, I'm the best in everything I'm doing, and then the German conservative person. And then you go to Spain, where they are also having their culture, and Eastern Europe, you go, you know, everyone is so different. And that's, in my opinion, a big challenge when we give feedback. Because if you get a feedback often from a person in Germany, it's very direct. It's like, you know, you, you did wrong, please correct it. Uh, or from our colleagues in Ukraine, too. We've seen the same there. But in Spain, they sometimes often go around it and like, you know, hey, I'm thinking. So how do you have any tools or tricks of how we can actually, because my, I don't want to sound like harsh to the other person, and I also don't want to like start to think, oh, okay, now I'm talking to you, and then I have to be very soft, and then talking to you, and then I can't be harsh. Do, are there any tools of how you give that feedback to different kinds of people? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the key to giving good feedback is giving it very, very often and talking about an actual situation that happened. You know, if you have a one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with your team once in three months, then you are telling me something, some kind of an emotional overview. It's really like, I don't, I don't care much about your feedback. But if you are telling me straight away, after I came late to the meeting, or after I didn't prepare to the meeting, I wish you would have prepared for that, I get feedback immediately, and I start paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I'll share one thing that really helped us in one agency I worked for. Uh, whenever we had a one-on-one -on -one with our manager, we were supposed to prepare a presentation ourselves about our own failures, about our own successes, and we would present it to the manager. So I would say, okay, in the last three months I achieved this, I think I was failing this, and so on. And the reason why it was not based on some kind of an emotion was because I was collecting feedback on myself every day of those three months. So after every meeting, uh, we would go and we would give each other a like sticky note, like those pink ones, uh, saying, I like that you came on time, I wish you would have prepared. And I would put it on a special notebook, and after three months, when I was preparing that presentation for my manager, I would have it full of those sticky notes. And those were true, and those were the 360 feedbacks, you know, that we are all after. And those were, those were the true things, and I would be seeing that it keeps repeating, that I keep coming late, and we would be actually discussing that, and we would not be discussing that only something that only my manager sees. So I think base, feedback should be based on something that actually happened. And it sounds very natural, but it's not often true. Yeah. And uh, so thank you for that. Again, any live questions? No one? Okay, we have more here, so.
You have 10 minutes left. And uh, yes, we, wait, 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 you have to get the, no, wait, wait, you have to get the microphone, come, come. <laughs> run, run. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think he needs an applause for being the first yes. one who's got good courage. Well, it's a, an easy question. I didn't do my homework. I wanted a little more information about your company and how it has grown. You said you went from 50 to something, a thousand. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little more insights? Yeah. So I, uh, nine years ago, I went to this tech conference and they stopped me at the registrations and they said the cloakroom for the waitresses is over there. I was a speaker. And I went on stage and they introduced everybody like, hey, this is uh, Jack, he's from Google, this is Karel, he studied University of Cambridge. And then I was on stage and they said, oh, this is Paulina, that is the only girl we have here. And, you know, and I, w I got really pissed. And when I got pissed, I started Googling. And I found out that only 3% of um, creative directors at advertising agencies were women, that there were 9% of speakers at tech and marketing conferences at that time who were female. I found out that only 5% of women start companies and they start startups. And I realized one other thing, that whenever I go to at a conference, I don't talk to other women. I guess because, you know, I was looking for a husband, so it's like a <laughs> competition. Uh, so I decided to create lunch, organize lunch during one of those conferences. And I invited all women who joined the conference to join me. I agreed with my brother that he would do a dress up, so I'm not there alone. And um, 50 women came and we started talking and we said, we want to be in touch. And that's how first we started as a Facebook group. And one of the women who attended was a, a journalist from a marketing magazine, and she published an article like, women started talking to each other. And, um, and I gave her an interview saying there should be more women on stages. And the other day, uh, like in a week, a guy called me and he said, you know, I read that interview, interesting insight. I think I want some women on stage. Do you know any women? And <laughs> I say, yeah, of course. And I, sa I sent a message to that Facebook group we created asking, hey, anybody wants to give a speech at that conference about Google Analytics? And all those women who were like really good and awesome, they were like, you know, I'm not very good at it. Like, I know I've been in this industry for 25 years, but I'm probably not good at it. <laughs> and, and I don't have the presentation skills. So I called uh, Google, I booked uh, a meeting room, I called my friend who's a presentation skills coach, and we organized our first training ever. And we, create, we taught 30 women how to present and how to go on stage. And this is how we became the educational company. Suddenly more people started coming to the group, more people were asking for trainings, more people were coming from the industry. And now we are a community that has over 30,000 women. Last year we trained over 10 10,000 people, and we really, 50% uh, of our uh, trainings are at scholarships, so they're dedicated to women who are maternity leave, who are unemployed, who are um, older, so the job market doesn't want them, and that is how we grew. So it really uh, started and grew because I was super pissed, and I found out that I'm not the only one. Uh, I hope I'm answering your question. <laughs> so. We have a, uh, we have a, another one. Very oh, good. Thank you. Good one. <laughs> Hi there. Um, thanks for the speech. I'm interested in your insights on what changes remote working and partial remote working will make for businesses, and in particular, business buying decisions. Uh, can I rephrase the question to make sure that I got it right? Sure. What, what's the difference between the remote work and uh, in-person work, like when it comes to those decisions? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, mm. for many businesses, they've had you know pr procurement rules that involve people in rooms making decisions, or you know they see each other face to face regularly to discuss how business will procure mm -hmm. things. And now that's not happening anymore. They might see each other once every three months. Mm -hmm. So, do you see any changes in how that might affect procurement in particular? But business yeah. in general too. Yeah. Thank you. I'll take some of the topics I talked about. Uh, for example. 
uh, the difference when it comes to company culture. I think it needs to be even more conscious when some of your team is working remotely. You need to be more conscious about the one-on-ones. You need to be more conscious on creating space where people could actually network and brainstorm with each other. Uh, when it comes to uh, hiring, I think you need to be conscious about the fact that uh, anybody, ca you can hire anybody from anywhere in the world. So you're, maybe your salaries need to be competitive, not just on the Czech market, but on all the market in there. I think when we are talking about the importance of communicating your vision, it needs to be an extra push for that. So you really need to organize much more often those meetings and those tasks. But also, I think it's about implementing tools. I think there are great tools. There is Product Board uh, for Product Roadmap. There, is, there are Asana. There are all the other things. And really utilizing all those structures. And one of the things that I really loved was uh, from Basecamp, how they are using writing in order to be asynchronous and in order to get on the one page. Uh, Jason Friedman, he wrote a book about it. And uh, it's, I think, easily downloadable for free. And he writes, about, he writes about the fact that he, for example, when he's making a decision, he's making a, a, an A4 about the decision. And that's how truly everybody can read it and how, how to get everybody on board. So I think it's, like a, it's a big question. <laughs> I tried to kind of pinpoint like at least some of the case studies, but I will be super happy to talk about it later. So we have time for one more question. Um, anyone that wants to take on that question? Now is the time. OK, I have more here, so I can continue. But OK, so um, we talked about, you talked about prioritization. And uh, what is, the question is here for Elias. What is your preferred method for prioritization? And, um, and how can you also like convene to your employee, like, we don't want to micromanage your employees too. And you now, you now prioritize for yourself, and you also prioritize for your company, but you also at the same time like don't want to. Uh, what's your, how do you prioritize? Just let's talk about it from your perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are two ways. One thing is I use the vision. Is it aligned with our vision? Is this helping us to create the impact we want to make? So are we really? Uh, getting more women on stage? Are we really getting more women on the job market? And if it's not adding to that impact number, if it's not adding to that vision, we are not doing that. And a second thing, you asked me about my favorite prioritization framework. I would, for, I, for example, love RICE. Um, you can read about it on Intercom webpage. And the RICE, uh, the R stands for reach. How many people can you reach with those uh, with that decision? Impact your the business impact. How how much impact it will have on your business? And C is for confidence. How much do you trust yourself on those two numbers that you stated previously? And E is an effort. How much time are you going to invest in that? And I think so often we are very good at lying to ourselves about how it, this is going to change the world, how this product feature is going to do it. And I think incorporating that confidence part is a, such a good one uh, when you are talking about prioritization. So that's one, for example, I would do. So thank you. And, and maybe the, the last thing is, could be the question of how do, you, how do you feel like now you come to, a, is this your first DrupalCon? Yes. And how do you feel that we are doing in terms of uh, diversity and, and including here uh, the diverse spirit of having, you know, what, what are you in comparison with the tech conferences that you've been to? And tell us your honest answer. I love it. I think it's really good. It's definitely, I have met women in the bathroom. That never happened in the, at the tech conference. So thanks a lot for also that. Also, it's more busy here, the, yeah, the women bathroom. Yeah, it's definitely more busy. Thanks a lot for your women at Drupal Awards. I attended that. And also diversity and inclusion team here is really great. And we had a great discussion. So I truly admire that. And I hope uh, you can be an inspiration to other conferences in tech. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you, Paulina. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we need like a customer expectations. They're always shifting, changing, reinventing. And the path to digital transformation is always evolving to meet them. 
This requires integrating new technologies, communicating and deploying across a myriad of touch points, devices and channels. Which is why you need a digital experience platform as a central technological foundation for digital customer experiences. Acquia's OpenDXP gives you the ability to seamlessly integrate back-end and front-end systems across it. All backed up by the flexibility of Drupal and the market-leading environment for developers and marketers, so you can build and deliver experiences to the right people at the right time. It's the freedom to create new capabilities without starting over, to roll out multiple campaigns in any language, to build and pivot and build again, giving you cross-channel continuity across the entire customer journey, putting monolithic solutions behind you and getting out in front of customer demand. That's the power of Acquia DXP.